So good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's great to see so many of you uh, interested in our uh, masterclass series. Um, this one has really grabbed your interest, designing engineering projects for decarbonisation. Um, lots and lots of interest. Uh, just a little bit of housekeeping before I introduce our two panellists. Um, everybody knows in the bottom of your screen, we have a chat box and we have a Q&A box. Please pop any questions that you have um, during the masterclass into either the chat or the Q&A and the, we have time at the end where um, David and Jason are going to um, answer any of those questions. So I uh, hand over to our panellists and we have David Collins, who's the engineering manager uh, at Cool Planet, and Jason Garner is an SME in boilers, thermal and cogen. Good afternoon, gentlemen, and thank you very much. I'll hand over to you now. All right, thanks, Sinead. Uh, good morning, good day. Um, good morning for me, good day to all of you, wherever you may be. Thanks for joining us. I'm Jason Garner. And um, so look, before we get into the presentation, let's talk a little bit about what is decarbonization. Um, we're not going to go philosophical on this, just really in the context of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, often decarbonization, decarbonization means a broad range of things. It's often not 100% reduction going to net zero. Um, net zero is preferred, but it's not always immediately viable. There's economics, there's logistics, there's all sorts of things to achieve net zero. And really want to just drive home that any reduction in carbon is a, is a, is a very positive step. Um, and then to then talk about the scopes, because that's the next thing in talking about decarbonization and really around scopes one, two, or three. And that's a question that a lot of program managers are really looking at as far as what are the scopes that we need to reduce? What's our obligation? What do we want to target? What we typically are seeing is, is really related to scopes one and two, um, but scope three is creeping in and becoming more prevalent. So this is in the context of decarbonization that we're talking about in the presentation today. <clears throat> so we'll cover three main sections. In the presentation today, the first being some project buy-in with some case studies. And then I'll hand it over to David for the decarbonization project engineering methodology. And then we'll close it out with benefits of an EMS, energy management system for the design process and decarbonization accountability. So, hold on. Sorry about that. So the first section, project buy-in with case studies. So let's talk about what buy-in means. I mean, buy-in means a lot of things, but we're gonna try to simmer it down into something that's a little easier to grasp and, and, and contain. And, and this is, you know, this is very subjective experience. There's some object, objective elements of this, um, but it would be interested to hear more about whatever other people think about project buy-in and, and some of the things that you found success in. But uh, the first step uh, from, from, from our perspective is early engagement and buy-in are so critical to establishing a decarbonization project and really setting the tone for, for, for collaboration and success. I mean, collaboration is key. Um, making sure everyone is on board and knowing what they're doing is key for the success. Um, and then two, establish and empower uh, project stakeholders at corporate and site levels. I mean, identifying the appropriate people that are on, that need to be on the team at whatever level of the organization, if it's third party subcontractors like an ESCO, um, whoever it may be, but to establish those key stakeholders and team members and then empower them for what their role in the initiative is on the, on, on the outset of the project. And then a really important one, and one of the things that, that David is really going to drive home in his portion is establish and agree the project execution strategy, and really to understand what the savings reduction and validation processes are, and I'll touch on that one in the EMS section. So there's three, three key points that are, that are big in, in establishing a, a groundwork and foundation for project success. So let's go through a case study. Um, we're going to go through two case studies, a positive one and a negative one, and then we'll summarize them on the back end of the two. So on the, on the positive case study, we have um, 
an example where 330,000 euros of savings were delivered, which is about 15% site-wide savings. And it, in this one, an executive at the global food company really engaged and, and was the champion for the, for the whole thing and really pushed for the ESCO to be involved to investigate refrigeration savings. And where some of this started was the on-site operators and engineers really understood that there was more to be had, but they were they needed to get outside help to achieve it. And so they really embraced the outside help and they were supported by their internal champion at, at the executive level. So then the ESCO really collaborated with the group um, and at the corporate and site level to, to really collect the data and then deliver a digital twin through the energy management system to validate and see where the opportunities were. So really at the end of all that, there was a, a very simple uh, solution and approach. And um, it was with small programming changes and set point adjustments. And it really, it was one of those things where um, it was so, there was elements that, of it that were so simple, there was some reluctance about the fact that it would do what it was said it would do. So through that point, there was education uh, and training, and there was a comfort level with the EMS and, and then what the digital twin was saying uh, to bring the operators and the plant people around. And all of this was established through identifying key stakeholders and empowering people and, and, and really driving towards the collaboration that allowed a very constructive conversation to get everybody comfortable and on board. So at the back end of that, when, when, those, when those, were, those things were implemented, I said 330,000 per year savings, 15% site-wide savings, and that's a very happy customer. And then further to that is the EMS was embraced and those savings and carbon reductions are still being delivered to this day. So a very, very positive case study that, that, that's delivering year over year. So let's move to a negative case study. Um, and this one has, there are some positive elements to it, but it's overall, it was, it was, it, it, it is a negative case study and, and we'll see why. So in this particular one, there was a large multinational company. The, the energy reduction, carbon reduction initiatives were started at the corporate level and really mandated and imposed on the site level teams. Um, and so the, the contracts with the, with the ESCO were through the corporate level. So it, when getting to site, um, there was low, low engagement because they really, those stakeholders had not been engaged. And the, the site just had a different impression about what the ESCO would be doing. So under the impression the ESCO would do less and that the site would do more, it just was, it was a natural, the whole project started in, in just natural conflict and unhealthy conflict. So, um, so through the project and through a, a lot of fighting, the ESCO was able to deliver the, the solutions that were contracted and improve the payback to 1.7 years, which was an improvement over the 2.7 years contracted. Um, and, and this was all this was all validated through M and B reports through the ESCO EMS system, um, and. The issue again was with, with key stakeholders not being involved, with people not being empowered, uh, the savings were not being safe, uh, signed off on. And um, this was because people didn't know what their role in the project was. They didn't know what their accountability level was. They, they, they were worried about being punished for something because they weren't, they weren't sure where they fit in the whole picture because this was a corporate imposed project on them. So Ultimately, the projects weren't signed off on and uh, the, the, the project, the savings weren't seen, like seen by corporate and the site and the project was deemed a failure, even though over delivering on the, on the contracted values. So let's look at this side by side. The negative example, uh, poorly defined commercial structure was imposed by corporate team on the facility. And we've talked about this um, and just understanding who the key stakeholders are, identifying them, aligning them, and empowering them is so important. And this wasn't done in the negative, negative example. 
Um, and a bit, another part of this also is the ESCO really failed to win over the site level stakeholders, despite delivering positive outcomes. I mean, could be in, in hindsight, could be looked at and say with the positive outcomes, there should have been a should ESCO should have been able to win over um, the site level stakeholders. Um, a big another big part of this was the EMS was not embraced. So the savings that were delivered would evaporate because there was no accountability about those those energy efficiency and carbon reduction measures year over year. Um, and again, that empowering by the corporate team or the overall team for people on the site just led to a fundamental lack of accountability. So, um, so then let's look at the positive example because there was a lot of good things in this one. Um, and, and, and one of the big takeaways in the positive example is that it's very important to have a champion um, on, on an initiative like this uh, or, or multiple champions, but just a champion nonetheless and someone that facilitates buy-in at all levels of the project, all levels of the organization at the project outcome. And this is one of the first things that needs to be done so that everyone knows what the mission and vision are, um, who, who's doing what, everyone understands where they fit into the team. Um, so that's, that's a very important part of, of establishing before really getting into the, the nuts and bolts of, of delivering a project. Um, the key stakeholders recognized and embraced opportunities at the outset, and that's very important. Um, corporate empowered the site level personnel to make meaningful decisions. Again, very, very important. Everyone understands where they fit into the project. The EMS was embraced uh, and is still used, and those savings are still seen today. If there's deviation from those savings, then those, those are, there's corrective action taken to get back within the savings and reductions. And objectives were clearly defined and exceeded. Um, again, really establishing the foundation and groundwork before getting into the nuts and bolts. Um, and, and one of the big things with, with delivering a project, especially a decarbonization project um, with the capital involved is that when you deliver a positive outcome, it really encourages deployment of other decarbonization projects. Um, you know, positivity breeds positivity. And so the, that, that just means that there's more opportunity to, to deliver more carbon savings. So I'll hand it over to my colleague, David Collins. Thanks, Jason. Um, so yeah, listen, what I'm gonna just talk about for the, say the next 10, 10 minutes or so, uh, is just a bit about the whole methodology from the start of a decarbonization journey um, up to really around the, the point of, of execution. So again, uh, just based on, on our experience, um, just wanted to talk a little bit about, um, so I suppose, some factors that we see are kind of crucial for success that kind of need to be in place from the outset. So again, this, these are, aren't in any particular order, but just, just um, and then hopefully some of these, uh, you, you can identify with some of these as well when you're, you're planning out, or maybe as you have already delivered uh, your own decarbonization programs. Um, but the first one there, Jason, I think has, has kind of touched on that through the case study. So making sure that engagement is there from the outset of the project, right from corporate level, um, management, regional, down to technical and operations uh, staff on, on the respective sites. So again, it's, it's, uh, it's key uh, to ensuring that uh, the project scope can be delivered um, to the agreed uh, criteria and, and the goals are achieved. So. The next one then is just about scheduling and, and you'll see this on, on the upcoming slides about making allowances uh, in your project timeline for the full design process. So often um, the energy audit, which we'll, we'll talk a bit about is kind of the first step in, in the process. Um, but at the on completion of an energy audit, many of the solutions are unlikely to be able to go straight into implementation. They need to be worked through a design process. And we, we talked to front end engineering design and detail design and those those phases of each of the projects take take time to deliver. But what you would expect is that coming out of your audit, uh, there will be some quick wins identifiable by the, by, identified by the ESCO that the site team can probably go ahead and implement straight away. Um, just in our own experience, just even this week, we, we completed an audit report there uh, approximately four or five weeks ago. We, we sent it to the client. Um, they had took time to review it. They were actually going through an annual shutdown. Uh, but yesterday on a call, they, they told us that they've already started to implement two or three of the solutions, which was, was really encouraging to, to hear. It's, it's not often you, you see that 
uh, a company being that proactive uh, on the output of, of an audit report. So it's it's exactly what you want to hear. They want to start delivering savings from day one. Um, they've obviously paid a fee for the audit, so they're looking to recoup that as, as, as soon as possible. So we'll, I'll talk a bit more about scheduling in the upcoming slides. Um, another one then, grant assistance programs uh, is key. So anything that is, I suppose can benefit uh, CapEx applications, the return on investment, uh, just being aware of what's available within your region, uh, um, uh, be it whatever jurisdiction your your site might be um, uh, be based in, um, being aware of the deadlines for applications. So, so for example, some grant assistance programs, both here in Ireland and North and in North America, are open all year round for for assistance, and that can be from the very outset of the project to support the fees associated with energy audits, with detailed design, and then obviously uh, towards uh, uh, capital costs as well. But again, ensuring that you've you've thought those out when you're putting together your program, uh, ample time for review periods by the respective bodies, the award, and being aware of when you need to draw down on those grant pay payments is also is also key. Um, one that's becoming more and more prevalent these days is is just I suppose alignment with financial year planning. So, again, often large companies, multinationals, are planning for uh, the year ahead. Uh, could be six plus months out. So again, having a concrete set of figures that you want to bring forward into those CapEx applications for the for the forthcoming year, that needs to be accounted for during your scheduling. Um, so again, having your audit completed, having a certain level of engineering design completed, that'll give a, a, a uh, an appropriate level of detail to justify a business case to put that in for funding um, it needs to be thought out as part of the process. And being aware of, of what else is, is in uh, competing for, for the same budgets. More often than not, companies won't have a dedicated decarbonization budget. Uh, that's probably going to be start changing over the, the coming years. If not already, uh, a lot of companies are, are setting up dedicated budgets for that. Um, but making the ESCO aware, aware of, I suppose, the criteria for ROI, if there's any particular weighting around carbon reduction. So again, it can focus the attention early on in the process to make sure uh, a, a concrete set of, of figures is brought forward uh, for the CapEx planning. Um, obviously goes without saying, but having an experienced ESCO uh, on, on your side is, is key to ensuring a, a good success at, uh, on completion of, of an audit and a decarbonization program. Um, making sure they have the requisite experience, the capabilities around utilities, but also um, for what we're seeing is you need to have uh, expertise around the process itself. So having people who, who understand the process, have experience of it, who know if, uh, if there's any set points, scheduling changes that, that may be recommended that they won't uh, inadvertently cause negative effect on the process. It's really key that the scope of, a, I suppose, of, a, of an energy reduction project or a carbon reduction project um, isn't just about utilities, it, it covers the whole site. So again, having that experience or um, working with an experienced ESCO is, is kind of key to the process as well. Uh, number six there is just about shutdown planning. So again, in the same way when we talk about planning out around financial years, again, with large multinationals, large companies, they may or in some cases may not uh, shut down for a period uh, during the year, which might be a week, it might be, might be less than that, or it might be up to three or four weeks. But again, planning your program around uh, essential tie-in works, particularly what, where we see around heat recovery projects is key. Uh, planning out your delivery periods for ma major equipment, making sure the equipment is there on time, um, being conscious of other works that the, the company or the client are doing during that, that, wind, that short window is also key as well. So it, it takes careful planning as well. Um, number seven, I'll, I'll talk to this uh, in the next couple of slides, but having a data set ready for a handover to your ESCO at the outset of the, the project is also key. It, it saves a lot of time up front. It saves key time when an ESCO would be attending site as well. Um, we ourselves will be very uh, um, aware of when we're visiting site that we have to be respectful of, of the company's time, that the resources that they're giving to us during the couple of days that we're on site um, because they all have a day job. So having a key set of data, um, a comprehensive set of data available to hand over to the ESCO at the outset is, is also a, a key uh, success factor. And then the, finally, just their internal budgeting, um, the energy audit and the subsequent engineering. So probably the, the front end engineering, um, obviously there's, there's fees associated with that. It's, it's going to be the first request for, for spend a company will have as they, they embark on, on a decarbonization journey. 
Um, so again, allowing for that, whether it comes from operational budgets or, or uh, it has to fall out of a financial year uh, dedicated budget, um, uh, it needs to be conscious that that's going to be the first spend before the inevitable larger capital request would go in for, for the energy efficiency projects. So these are just a number of uh, items we, we, we were thinking of um, that's worth it while uh, pointing out to you today, but there's, there's going to be many more. But um, just in terms of what a typical project development process looks like, just starting on the left-hand side there, um, in our experience, um, often a company in an ESCO would, would make contact. Um, and really, there's, there's a phase there where it's, it's kind of exploratory, where we're, I suppose, working out uh, the potential for both parties to work together. It's establishing the criteria that I, I mentioned on the previous slide as well, particularly around timing, availability of CapEx, setting the goals for, for what the focus of the, the assessment should be. And assuming both parties agree to proceed, then it, it, it goes into energy audit phase. And again, that's to build upon, uh, I suppose, any, any high level uh, data assumptions that were, were made during the opportunity assessment. And that's, I suppose, that's an intensive period of, of what you'll see coming up with about 12 week, a 12 week program uh, to develop, I suppose, a shopping list of solutions. And from there, that can then be carried forward into subsequent stages of, of engineering. So there's two stages of front end engineering. Of, of engineering that we'll talk to. So front-end engineering or feed um, really takes those high-level concepts at the end of the energy audit and I suppose puts more, um, more, more meat on the bones really around um, what the, the solution will need to look like, what the final capex might be, the savings as well. And it's just building upon the data sets that you would have gathered during the energy audit, but it's, it's focusing on the solutions that the company with the support of the ESCO have identified to move forward into a potential scope for, for EPC. You can then move into detailed design on, on those solutions, and then it falls into execution commissioning. And then obviously a very important point, and Jason alluded to this in the case studies, is measurement and verification. So I suppose setting up the, the, the boundaries around M and V for, for solutions at the outset, using uh, recognized IPMVP protocols, using certified professionals around measurement and verification as well, establishing plans and reports that can be signed off early on in the process, establishing responsibility as well, uh, to Jason's point about who ultimately will sign off on those savings um, is also key because obviously you want to prove the, the concepts that were identified during energy audit and, and detailed design. And they may or may not have been delivered under an energy performance contract, but, but nonetheless, the savings need to be verified. Um, and finally, just step eight there is just around, and, and again, Jason will touch on this in, in the EMS section, um, but just how measurement and verification and how this whole process falls into continuous improvement. Um, again, there's, there's different on-ramps, and you'll see this from a, an upcoming slide of where design projects can, can fall in under a continuous improvement phase, how an EMS supports that as well. Obviously, the availability of an EMS to give data upfront into an energy audit into design phases of a project is, is key as well and using that EMS as well to, to continuously monitor the savings that are verified um, during the MMV process is also um, a key feature for a decarbonization program. So just to talk a little bit about the energy audit. Um, so usually it, it kicks off um, in, in the first week and it's a data gathering phase. So there's an opening meeting between the site team and the ESCO. Um, and usually a questionnaire is issued to the site to, to complete. So again, to the point I made about having a data set uh, readily available, uh, items like utility bills, SCADA screenshots, any downloads that are available from, from a SCADA, site drawings, et cetera, et cetera are very useful to, to have ready to hand over to an ESCO as you, you start to embark on your, your decarbonization plan. So often then there's a, a review meeting between the site team and, and the ESCO team just to, to, to help them maybe complete the questionnaire and make sure that the data we get um, is as complete as possible before we, we land on site. Um, the ESCO then may take a number of weeks, two to three weeks, um, just analyzing that data up front and then planning out the, the site visit itself. So to my point about, I suppose, being respectful of the, the resources on, on, a, on a company's site, preparing in a, a detailed agenda to say what the ESCO would want to do uh, during the days on site and get, agreeing that with the, the, the point of contact on the company side is, is key. Um, the audit itself then takes place. So again, depending on the scale, uh, complexity of the, the site in question, that typically could be between three to five days in our experience. 
And then on completion, a second or a fire, a follow-up list of, of queries that will be, will be issued out to the client um, for, for, for completion. The next phase is really uh, solution design. So back at base, the Esquan and, and their team are working on the solutions uh, to, I suppose, present back as part of the energy audit. So working on the savings calculations, the CapEx figures, the carbon reduction figures, Often we find it's useful to have an interim review with, with the client uh, during that period as well, just to make sure everyone's aligned on the direction the audit is taking. And then you're into a phase of reporting back, having a review meeting, again, getting that, that, that the, the client's feedback before a, a final version of the report is, is, is posted, um, and then agreeing a follow-up review period to agree next steps. And those next steps are inevitably what solutions will proceed into the next phase of, of engineering. So. To that point, front-end engineering, um, on completion of the audit, you agree your solutions that would go into front-end engineering. It's often the more larger, the more complex solutions that require a, a feed step. And what you're trying to do is you want to establish the base of design for the solution. So you're focusing in on the major equipment, getting specifications for it. You're producing PFDs for, for the solution itself, looking at type point diagrams and updating the savings and CapEx figures that were established during the energy audit. I suppose at this point, it's still a gateway or a, a stage gate um, to say whether or not this particular solution will be included or excluded from the scope of, of the energy performance contract or the engineer procure and construct contract. Um, and that's, in our experience, again, feed exercises typically take between six to eight weeks to complete, but could be, could be that bit longer, again, subject to the solutions in scope. Sometimes as well then on completion of the audit, uh, solutions may be able to go straight into engineering detail design. So these again are the more straightforward solutions. So, so for example, control changes uh, that we may identify during or NESCO may identify during an energy audit are usually quick wins. So the, the company may require just a deep, more detailed control philosophy to be established. They may ask the ESCO to do that. We may find that all the existing instrumentation control valves are already in place and it simply is a case of uh, establishing a more detailed control philosophy for the suggested state changes that can be done as part of an EDD exercise. For more complex solutions that may have either come through feed, you're talking about a design document, and that's where you're, you're focusing in on the major and minor equipment. More detailed drawings are being, being produced, so you're into PID level, general arrangement drawings, type point diagrams again, and again, you're updating your CapEx and your savings. But the exception might be around the capex is you're, you're actually more or less preparing a tender pack to issue out for installation uh, to contractors for mechanical electrical civil structural um if a solution is generally falling into detailed design a, a decision is generally made at that stage that it's, it's going to be in the scope of of the epc project and again in our experience 12 to 15 weeks is, is generally the timeline for for engineering detailed design so um those of you who would have uh, joined Cool Planet Masterclasses in, in recent months would, would have seen this uh, continuous improvement workflow diagram before. So uh, I won't spend too much time going over it again, but just to say it, it talks to you about where you have different sources of information on your site, either from a SCADA system, from lab information systems, from existing energy meters, utility bills, um, operator logs, et cetera. The benefit of having all that collated in a single uh, intelligent platform, such as, as Cool Planet's Clarity platform, uh, is key. And off that, then you can generate consolidated reports around energy production, yield, etc. And again, it can be used as a basis to identify problems and opportunities. So if you set up your EMS correctly, and again, Jason will touch on this in, in the in the last section of 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 the masterclass. Uh, to use that to identify problems and opportunities, that will push those solutions or opportunities in through a natural design cycle. So if it's a quick win up, uh, quick win solution, it may be an operational change, uh, very little engineering involved, action can be taken. And again, using your EMS platform, you can confirm the effect of those changes. If it requires a more uh, comprehensive or uh, uh, complicated um, equipment change or solution, um, it can go into the design cycle. So in through concept design, in through feed and detail design, goes through an execution phase between implementation and commissioning on site. And again, you're using your EMS to uh, confirm the effect of the solutions. So what you'll find is that from an energy audit point of view, that's a natural on-ramp there after the EMS is in place to start your energy audit as well. You may have an existing EMS in place, 
that is gathering a basic level of information or a very advanced EMS, but having it set up correctly to, to give the ESCO access to it and the availability of that data, the granularity of it, will hugely benefit, I suppose, the success of the energy audit. Um, and obviously, naturally, then, from a design point of view, anything that comes out of the audit, anything that comes out of the, the EMS in terms of opportunities, that is the natural on-ramp as well for feed and detail design um, exercises as well. So I might just hand back to Jason now, just to talk a bit more about EMS. Thanks, <clears throat> Thanks David. Um, so just to close out the last section in the presentation, um, the benefits of an EMS for design process and decarbonization accountability, and, and really just talking about the EMS, EMS is, is the, the biggest tool that, um, that we found to prevent savings and carbon reduction from becoming vaporware and just evaporating after the ESCO is gone. It's the, it's the accountability tool, it's the tracking tool, it's the tool in which it's demonstrated that those, those reductions are delivered year over year um, and they can, they can be reliably demonstrated, all that data is socialized. So it's a, it's a strong element of these decarbonization projects. So an energy management or monitoring system, um, it's, a, it's a broad term. Um, it, it, they do fairly specific things, but the, the, the level of tools that are available are fairly broad. So the one that we're going to look at is called Clarity, um, and it is um, it is an, a resource asset energy management system. Um, it, it's a digital tool. It's based. It's cloud based, and um, really a, a thing to mention. And one of, one of the things I wanted to touch on was something that David has mentioned is ideally to start a decarbonization effort, the first thing that's done is an energy management monitoring system is put in place to establish baselines, to establish the economics, to establish what the opportunities are in, in a consistent form. Um, but that's not always the case because of how capital approved, uh, expenditure approvals are, are taken on. So um, sometimes that, that data is not available then and we have to go about it in a different way. Um, but often, um, what's most important, though, is that it's, it's in place during the project implementation, and it's there for the accountability piece, the accountability piece of the project. And, and one of the big things about EMSs is, is that they, they don't replace any process control. They're not control systems. They, they reside outside of the process network, and they're really aggregating data um, from the site, and that's all sorts of data, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And part of the reason and way in which these EMSs promote accountability, especially cloud-based ones, is that they're socializing that data. It's, it's being made available to, um, to whoever is shared access uh, within the project team. Um, and that, that really helps drive action and, and, and ensures that the savings and reductions are held year over year. And then kind of the last point in this, on this slide was just to kind of talk about the, uh, the benefit, not, over, not only for this project or whatever your current decarbonization project is and an implemented EMS, but it really sets the tone and the basis for identifying additional solutions. And then it really helps to catapult the, the level of, of comfort and, 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 um, and reliability of the results that you could get out of any future projects. So EMS implementation and features, looking at uh, four key areas of the EMS. Uh, there's the remote data integration. Uh, really, the data, as said before, there's the process data. There is all sorts of metadata, drawings, PNIDs, photos. There's any, any level of types of data that can be integrated, daily reports, monthly reports. Um, so with the data in place, that can be visualized. Similarly to the way data can be visualized in a, in a uh, controls historian, but with more user interface, more user uh, subjectivity on how it's viewed and how it's shared. Um, but uh, where the, the, the system really comes in to its own is really around the modeling and analytics and then how that modeling and analytics turns into action. So around the modeling and analytics, 
um, with, with an EMS system that has a team of experts behind it, um, people that understand and design that equipment, uh, regression models, process models can be developed to really overlay into the EMS and they become predictive models for how the system should behave from a benchmark basis and, and, and best practices. And with that, it can establish a set of boundaries that say that this piece of equipment or this plant or these systems need to be operating with these parameters. And if they're not, we're not hitting our targets. And if we're not hitting our targets, then we want watchers, the number three, to establish and, and to tell us whether or not we're hitting our targets. If we're, if we're not hitting our targets, then we really want to know that and we wanna know it quickly. And that is the report in action. So once the watchers have kind of, they're looking at the modeling, they're looking at the analytics and they're saying that, listen, we're outside the bounds um, and we need to report it to the overall group. And the action, and the action part of this is that any number of people can be assigned uh, an action report can be put in place, a very specific action report about whatever the deviation is. If there's a pressure that's rising or falling or whatever it may be, there's a, there's a whole list of things that need to be taken care of uh, and that, that needs to be validated through the overall team to make sure that those benchmarks are achieved. And everyone knows that the benchmarks aren't achieved because the watchers continuously say, listen, we're outside of the bounds. So it drives the accountability um, in a positive and meaningful way year over year. So I'm just going to show a couple of, of screens here um, on the remote data integration and just uh, there's several things that we can see here. We're just running through different types of data that are in this EMS. Um, you know, a lot of the data is, is process data tags, um, but then we're looking at metadata, different pictures, and, you know, there's tags that can be put on this. So there's there's all sorts of things that can be done in the EMS beyond just energy. I mean, there's asset management as well. The modeling analytics, just to touch on this point again, um, and just to show an example of what some of this looks like, um, where there are certain performance criteria that are mapped, and then there is the digital twin or the, or, or the, the multi-regression analysis uh, model that's put in place to look at the deviations between the way the system or systems are operating versus how it should be operating. Um, it, it allows a visualization of where the deviations are, allows a, a deep dive into where those things may be. And it may, it, that visualization helps to determine whether or not the, the correct watchers are being established or the correct people are being even notified of action. So it, it's a way to visualize the data and more than the data, it's to visualize the, the, the complex performance of the system into carbon emissions or energy input rather than the production the machine gives you. The events and tasks, this is just an example of kind of what can be written. And like, this is infinitely um, customizable to each situation, each plant, each user group, um, each company, um, each level of the company. So it's just however the system needs to be set up for who's getting the action reports, who has to take the action, who has to respond and confirm that the action has been taken. Um, and that, you know, it, it, it's really not ever closed out until the system is be, before is performing per the, um, through the benchmark uh, requirements of the facility or the plant or the systems. And those benchmarks can be any number of things. It can be production, it can be yield, uh, it could be carbon emissions, it could be energy cost, it could be all of those things. And then really in, in performing and optimizing all those things. So there's there's any number of ways that this can be, this can be managed within a group or an organization to ensure that the, the system is, is operating optimally for that organization and that group. And then reports, finally, on the reports is um, th there's all sorts of, in, in many, every facility and every company, there's all sorts of reports that are generated. Um, legacy reports, um, there's different groups and 
there's different departments that produce reports and then those are compiled in some way. Some of them are manual. A lot of them are manual. Some of them are automatically generated. Um, but with the EMS, these reports are fully automated in the sense that even the manual reports can be uploaded um, and automatically populated into the EMS. And then it, this the EMS, the way it's set up, it can be custom, fully customizable again, but in this particular instance that we see here, that it's color coded. And uh, the color coding really helps us, that draws our eyes to the areas that we need to be looking at. And this is based on our pre-established KPIs or production figures or whatever it may be, but it really helps to minimize the time spent in certain areas and just, just focus on what needs to be focused on. So that again, these reports are fully customizable and it, it, this, is, this helps for the executive team or the management team to really see that the decarbonization efforts are, are, are delivering and there's confidence that they're being delivered. So that really closes us out on, on the presentation on the modules, but just to discuss a few points here, um, in, in establishing a decarbonization project, what is the project mission and vision? Um, are the key stakeholders are identified? Um, do, are they engaged? Do you have full buy-in um, to ensure that the project will be, will be successful, that people will be engaged, that they will contribute, and that the savings and the reductions will be delivered? And you can feel confident about that to all the state, because there's, there's direct stakeholders in the project and there's stakeholders in the company, the organization, whether they're shareholders, um, whether they're owners, whoever it is, but those are state, indirect stakeholders in this as well. And if there's a decarbonization initiative, it's important that those, those targets are being met and that everyone can be confident that when it's stated that they're being delivered, that they are delivered year over year. And setting that foundation is very, very important. So then just kind of a, a, a reflective question for, for everyone is just to ask yourself, is your approach delivering positive outcomes? Are you confident with what, what's being delivered and how you're approaching these, uh, these types of projects? Um, are, there, are there things that maybe were mentioned here that, that seems like it would be good to implement and in, in how you execute these types of projects? And then if just un, unsure, overwhelmed, we can support and guide you. Uh, we're here. To, we're here to help. So thanks very much for everybody's time. Really appreciate it. That was really great, guys. Really, really interesting. Um, I just I, know, I can see from a lot of the guests that have joined us joined us that there's some people from other industries than food, and just to say that these projects can go across any uh, industry at all or this process, yes, agree. <laughs> As in a lot of people from pharma um, have signed yep, up. Yep, agreed, yep, absolutely. So a couple of questions there um, in the um, Q&A box, uh, and anybody else who wants to pop one in, please, please do. Um, so uh, one of the guests has asked, uh, if I wish, can you see the Q&A box? Uh, I wish to use, if I wish to use a green solution to aid my decarbonization plan for power utility, if its failure has an impact on my goods and services, do I need to risk assess a backup solution that might be non-green but short-term use? Ask it again. I missed the first, I'm missing something in it. Uh, can you see the Q&A box? It, oh. in the bottom of, no. So, yeah. if, yes. So let me jump down to the other one. Um, have you seen many energy audits being completed and then no subsequent action from that? Oh, oh, I see. Um, I see if I wish to use a green solution to aid my decarbonization yeah. plan for power utility, if its failure has an impact on my goods and services, do so I need to risk a set of backup solution that might be non-green but short-term use? Um, I guess it, for me in that situation, it, it really depends. Um, it, it's how often, what's the failure mode and how often is the failure expected? And then what's the total, what's the total volume or quantity of, of carbon that could be emitted with the backup solution? 
um, you know, is, is it a full backup or is it just a temporary backup for um, just to, to bridge the gap during a, a, a peak outage, whatever that outage or, or a short outage and whatever that outage may be. Um, but it could it could require um, an assessment, but it really depends. Yeah, that's it's a good point, Jason. I mean, the if you look at a traditional, maybe a heat pump project that's going to generate heat off electricity that might be considered green. Um, more often than not, uh, to, I suppose maybe to the 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 question, it's to aid decarbonization and to your opening slide about is it ever going to get to 100%? If that new green solution is only going to get a certain amount, the existing systems will still need to be retained to support the heat pump to provide the top up heat, but also still remain there um, as backup if if the solution uh, did go down for some reason or if it was down for annual maintenance. Um, so more often than not, particularly around retrofit, the existing systems stay in place uh, as backup to the green solution and also uh, provides that contingency as well for continued operation. And just to, to tag on, I mean, it, it also depends on it. If, if the target is net zero, then absolutely. Um, but if you're, if you're looking for reduction in general, I guess it really depends on what the overall objectives are. Um, so. Yeah, there's there's a number of ways to look at it. Yeah. Um, the second question about energy audits. I mean, going back through the years, uh, so I would have been involved in countless energy audits that a report would have been done, handed over, and you would you would find the same report hadn't been action for a number of years. Um, we'd we'd rarely see any of that these days. I mean, if you're committing to do an energy audit, you need to be thinking beyond that. Like, is to to my point about planning out your decarbonisation program. The audit is to get the shopping list of solutions and then you're selecting from that what's going to be implemented mm -hmm. over a subsequent period so um, if people are spending money doing energy audits just for the sake of it i, I know there are compliance rules about mandatory regulatory um, audits that need to be done every and a certain number of years in many countries here in ireland in the, in the uk but really companies are nowadays they're they're acting on those audits um i don't think it's 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 it shouldn't be or i don't think it has been seen as a, a tick the box exercise because i suppose um they're being mandated now to, to deliver substantial carbon savings um by 2030 by 2050 mm -hmm. so i suppose the time to act is is, is now and uh, i guess that sort of feeds into the same thing people just do an audit for its sake is like we're, have you seen where the buy-in was good, the traction was good, but the project didn't advance. And I guess, yeah. Yeah, um, you, you do, uh, if that is seen, uh, yeah, I, I guess I have, I have seen that um, a, a few times and, and, um, and kind of post-mortems or kind of looking back on what the, what the reasonings may be. Um, often it's just because uh, if, if, if there was good buy-in um, and there was a good project or a good set of projects and there was good opportunity, but the but ultimately the project was never funded and that things didn't move forward into implementation, I guess what I've seen is that it ultimately means that you haven't identified all the correct stakeholders. <laughs> so, and that's ultimately whether or not the person that, or the people or the group or the department that makes the decision to put the money in place, um, that uh, that initiative may have a champion, um, but that that initiative isn't championed throughout the organization all the way to the top. So um, that's that's really the thing is 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 finding that champion and making sure that that culture is in place throughout the organization. Um, and that's typically what I've seen with everything was going well, was, uh, project was moving along. Um, things looked great, everybody was communicating, and then it came time to move forward, and then it didn't, then you've ultimately missed a stakeholder somewhere. Okay, um, we have no more questions here at the, oh, wait, um, <laughs> quick one was just popped in there. Do we have stats to share per industry sector showing where audits are driving CapEx decisions? i.e. EOL, assets, reliability decisions, or maintainability critically. Uh, can you see that? Let me just grab that, put it into chat. Um, 
just to say to everybody, I've been asked a couple of times, um, are we going to send out a recording? Yes, we will be sending a recording out um, afterwards um, for anybody that's here uh, and has signed up. And if you have any more questions and you'd like to do that in a one-to-one, -one, just drop me uh, a line. You have my email address and I can set up a one-to-one -one meeting with anybody. Can you see in the chat? David, do you want to take that one or you want me to take that one? Uh, you can jump in. Okay. So um, I guess on stats for industry to share, not specifically, uh, we do have those stats, but we, we don't necessarily have them um, to share right now. Um, but where audits are driving CapEx decisions, just in general, I mean, that the audits are the the, the primary engine for the CapEx decisions in, 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 uh, in my experience. And um, so, you know, getting the team uh, organized, getting the team established, getting the mission objectives established uh, before the audit is taken on, before the people, the ESCO or the, the corporate team, the overall audit team um, descend on site and perform the audit um, it is critical because that's, that's a part of kind of congealing the team and then making sure that the, everyone's comfortable with the results of the audit so that when it comes time to looking at what the, what the returns are or what the costs are, what, whatever, whatever the mechanisms are, the, the hurdle rate or the carbon reduction, whatever the, 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 the mechanisms and criteria for it, um, th that everyone's comfortable and confident with, with what the audit is saying that they are. To push it forward through um, capex review and approval. Yeah, maybe maybe one to add to that is um, like audits certainly do do drive that capex planning. Um, a recent example I can think of uh, a particular site we're planning an expansion. They um, they had I suppose they earmarked adding additional capacity around uh, thermal, compressed air, cooling. But an audit would maybe would identify opportunities, obviously, to reduce the existing loading, meaning that their existing plant will be capable of handling the, the expansion. Um, and maybe within that plant, instead of uh, replacement of end of life, um, maintenance, maintaining it, or maybe putting that plant as a standby, uh, giving time to, to repair it as part of a program, um, could be one result as, as, as part of the, the audit process. I hope that addresses okay. your question, Peter. They were great questions and it was a great presentation, guys. Really enjoyed uh, listening to that. Um, really easy to understand. Thank you. Um, thanks to everybody for joining us. Uh, as I said earlier, please do get in contact with me directly. I can set up a call. You can speak to one of the engineers directly, um, brief chat. And um, uh, thank you, David, and thank you, Jason. Thanks, Sinead. Thanks, everyone, for your time. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye.